conversation of change is that uh, we have launched this conversation of change and we are the first speaker uh, on the coc and it's a video interview series uh, basically centered around one of the most uh, pertinent crises of our time which is climate change and conversation of change attempts to synthesize perspectives uh, around climate action skills demands um, uh, market demands as well as journeys of various climate leaders and their role in the climate ecosystem um for our larger audience we have today mr partha basu from environmental defense fund he is an accomplished senior executive with more than 16 years of experience in government relations emissions management fundraising and strategic leadership ex um, leadership experience in a un partnership in depth and demonstrated uh, delivery expertise at multiple locations global projects proven ability to initiate prudent relations and partnerships is also recognized as a trusted innovator advisor and skilled strategist with unparalleled insights in international and domestic government policy making welcome mr vartha um just to start with our first question today um could you just describe your work at the environmental defense fund and what your role as lead in the advisor looked like yeah so i uh, lead the air quality uh, energy and methane team in etf in india uh, what we are trying to do here is uh, uh, work with several organizations in in the domain uh, trying to see that whether and how we can uh, make the government a better uh, stakeholder in solving uh, the air quality problems uh, we focus mostly on capacity and knowledge building uh and science because uh, science is one of our key things and that is something we want to emphasize on and uh, another important area where we uh, like to emphasize on is technology and innovation um thank you for sharing more about edf as well as your role um do you have more than 18 plus years of experience and you would have uh, how would you describe your career journey into this space and what were your key learnings from this journey good question uh well yes uh, i have been in this space for a long time uh and uh, i have been working on air quality and emissions uh, uh, in india and uh, to be honest uh, this has been uh, a very good journey because there was a time when air quality was not in the priority uh Uh, of people of organizations uh not to talk about any particular but it was not in in importance even ngos were looking at it uh, uh scantily uh so from that uh, period till where we are standing today i see that there has been a lot of change and there has been a lot of positive change. uh not only in terms of capacity but also in terms of knowledge knowledgement and action uh yes i i do realize at the same time that uh, we are at uh, at a situation where we are facing the heat of climate change in a in a big way in a, a very very apparent manner and probably the action that we are seeing today needs to be in multiples exponentially but nevertheless let's understand that uh what we had seen uh five or 10 years back and what we are seeing within this period uh, has been really massive um so whether it is in terms of uh, uh, organizations holding hands uh to help and work with the government or whether it is uh, the private sector coming and holding hands and uh, working on sustainability and doing their good I I think uh, I will say that it has been a very good journey and we have a lot to see and I really hope that this uh, trajectory keeps on going upwards and we are able to make some tangible changes. Um thank you for sharing that. Um so if I have to ask you what are the various challenges faced by climate organizations because um i see a lot of people want to transition into this area now which is very well recognized and you are saying that that journey is also now people are more uh, open about it and they are more aware about it and um, 
if i have to ask you um, when it comes to retaining talent and attracting talent, talent within even say with edf and the various places that you have worked with what are the various challenges faced uh, by climate organizations especially when attracting and retaining talent yeah uh, so climate change organizations definitely face uh, a very big challenge of uh, understanding and uh, and also uh, the capacity that we that exists in the country uh, we actually if you see we were very good at creating courses uh, which could give us uh, good doctors is officers accountants etc etc uh, but we could never create something which was specifically for climate change or air pollution for that matter uh, there are pieces uh, there are um, uh, uh, professional courses later uh but then on a, a graduate level we still do not have anything so ready hires is a problem uh from from that perspective uh i think another uh, challenge that uh, all the ngos face in a large extent is that sometimes uh, we have we, we find that there is a lot of passion uh but we do not find that there is uh, uh probably there, there is a good direction and understanding on how to move ahead on that uh so so somehow for example edf has a program called the climate core uh where we have uh several children uh masters postdocs uh, joining us and they work with us for a couple of months and when we place them at the private sector to actually work on it so there was a time when uh, aspirants for those courses were very low because probably they did not know what they could have done uh, or what they could have contributed or probably they did not see a career line on that um today we are at a situation where we are getting a lot of courses so maybe that thing is breaking so we have about 30 35 uh, students that we get but then let's not forget that we are a billion plus population in country so getting 30 or 40 people at the end of the year is not a big number actually we should be looking at hundreds if not thousands so uh, so i, I think uh, we have to understand that a uh, we need to fulfill the aspiration of a young person who is joining an, an organization in this space and we have to although it is passion but then passion doesn't feed family so we have to really uh, find ways of paying them paying them really really well in a competitive manner but at the same time we uh, the youngsters who are joining us also need to understand that probably this is just not a job and this is a little more than a job where we really expect somebody to i do not know how and what to explain uh, as an example of going out of the way to do things at times but then maybe it requires that level of service now given the time that we are facing such a big brunt of uh, climate change uh, totally so uh, if i have to ask you like what happens is that even when uh, climate asia what we do is that we do attract a lot we do a lot of talent acquisition work where we attract talent and you know match up with the industries and um, ask them so we, we a lot of people who are transitioning uh, from one career to another one and in their mid 30s and you know um, now uh, want to do something uh, for the environment and uh, have that passion uh, what are the various skill sets so how does that transition takes place um, uh, what are, what is your advice and what are the various or most important skill sets that you would share with us uh, that could help us or uh, help our larger audience understand the whole or uh, ecosystem well i i think uh, as far as uh, first of all uh, talking about transition or working in this sector i should just say one thing that a lot of time i have heard i do not know you you guys have heard that i have heard that uh, ngos uh, i'm uh, i am retired i should find a place to work in the ngos somehow people have this uh, 
this thinking that as if NGOs are not professional organizations. Uh, I think that has changed drastically. NGOs today are very professional and they really look forward to having professional uh, colleagues and uh, in, in the organization. Uh, that, and, and to be honest, if you see a lot of people in NGOs today are joining with professional skill sets. They have done MBAs and then they're joining. They have done um, uh, engineering and they're joining. Uh, so I, I think uh, I think we, we, we do not exactly have skill sets for um, NGOs uh, because the requirements and the NGO work is so varied. Uh, but I see people with uh, journalists background, uh, people with research background, people who are professionals, probably good enough to work on policy or, or some production line are also joining NGOs today and want to make a difference and are contributing what they have learned professionally, which they could have actually used in a corporate setting as well. But they are happy to share it with us, uh, with the NGO world, which is fantastic. No, um, completely agree on this. Um, thanks for sharing this thoughts, Vato. Um, uh, one question that I would ask you again on this is, what is one advice you would like to give to a senior or mid-level professional who's transitioning into this? as well as one advice for a fresher who's just entering um, right after college into this space. And lastly, somebody who is in the senior level low role and want to transition. What are the three advices at different areas would you be giving? Um, okay. Well, one common advice that I want to give to all three of them, first of all, is that please treat it as another professional work. Don't think that this is just a, a uh, just an easy thing of uh, uh, social service. NGOs are today very professional. The work that we are doing is very important and uh, companies have deadlines to match. We have climate change to match and control. So we have a very shorter timeline, uh, number one. Number two is that, that for youngsters who are coming, I want to say that, uh, uh, one of the most important skill sets that any NGO requires is motivation and self-motivated individuals. If you have that, please join us. And uh, we are always up for looking for young talents and that would be fantastic. For the mid-level people, I want to uh, tell them to take a, uh, be very clear about what is the, uh, what is the step that they are, they're going to take and what is the, ask that they're going to fulfill because they are at a juncture where they probably have other responsibilities as well. Uh, if they think that this is the job that they, that they want to do it and uh, this can suffice the needs of the family, great, awesome. Uh, uh, for senior people who have been professionals in different fields, I will say that please join us, bring your skills, bring your experience that you have learned so long and uh, used it with the private sector, please share it with us. We require that. We, it will be very, it will be something that the uh, entire landscape will actually uh, welcome and uh, use. We're very happy. Those are very valuable advice. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. So. Um, the, the next question I'll, I'll come now is in January 2019, the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change launch the national clean air program to prepare clean air action uh, plans with an objective to reduce uh, pm 2.5 pollution by 20 to 30 percent by 2024 as compared to 2017 uh, in 122 cities what is your opinion on it since you are closer to that deadline oh i, I think uh, that is that is that is fantastic and that is what i meant when i started by saying that there has been a lot of action on that and the kind of money that NCAP is uh, making available to the non attendant cities in order to spend on air quality improvement is something uh, marvelous. Uh, what at, at the same time, I do want to mention one challenge, and that is something which the government is already facing, is sometimes when uh, the states or the cities are not able to understand what would actually help them solve their air quality problem. So I think that is one part where uh, some cities are, are actually struggling. 
Uh, some are very smart and they really know what is required and they're meaning, making those meaningful investments which the government is uh, helping them with. Uh, but some are struggling and they require a little, of, a little bit of a handholding, something which the NGOs and the civil society is doing, but something which the government would uh, really get a lot of help if there was uh, some, some kind of a progress on that front. So in a way, I think this is a fantastic thing. Uh, it has happened and it has put a lot of important discussions right on the forefront, which is uh, very, very important from a political perspective. Um, thank you on that, uh, Pardo. Um, I have one more question for you. Uh, you run your own weather station and posted uh, posts and sites on Twitter. Uh, what prompted you to undertake this activity? And that is usually done by institutions, but you are doing it as an individual. So how did it start and what prompted you? Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm surprised that you know about it. Uh, yes, uh, that's true. I have been running this weather station uh, for past uh, uh, eight or uh, eight, seven or eight years. And uh, to be honest, uh, this, is, uh, this has been a very good learning. And when I started, I was doing it amateur because I was posting, uh, sharing information with a website called Dark Sky, which is now bought by Apple, uh, who are providing the uh, information and weather data. But, and I also wanted to understand how air quality changes with micrometrology, uh, because especially in urban settings where there are tall buildings and narrow alleys, the, there is a lot of gully or a funneling effect that happens and air pollution can travel from one corner of a city to another using those. So I just wanted to see, uh, that is how it started. I basically wanted to understand how micrometrology plays, an, uh, plays a role in air pollution within a city. And if there is any kind of an insight that we could uh, utilize. Uh, but at the same time, I think I also um, you know, got to learn from, from this setup that uh, while we see one temperature and one weather forecast for an entire city like Delhi, but actually if you see there are a lot of different weather patterns within Delhi. Uh, the, I'm not talking only about rain that one part of Delhi receives rain and another part doesn't, but also in terms of temperature. Uh, also in terms of certain wind velocity at certain areas. Um, and, and this is surprising to see that in a city like Delhi, which is almost landlocked and doesn't have any, any particular, uh, uh, that kind of a topographical change actually gets to see so much of change in, uh, in, in the metrology. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this was more on an educational purpose. People can, can compare and see how it is different from the rest of Delhi in a small area and uh, how it changes with the various uh, structures that we all uh, create, we develop, I mean, whether it is buildings or, yeah. That, that's interesting. Um, you've also campaigned about the importance of pedestrian infrastructure um, and appropriate policies. Uh, what improvements can India make to accommodate the non-motorized uh, demographic? Yeah, so uh, Ashita, this is something very, very important. And at one point of time in uh, 2010, 20, uh, till 2014 or so, I was campaigning a lot on this part. Also because I see that there is a direct connection with uh, air pollution and uh, pedestrians. Uh, how it works is basically uh, uh, transport is, in any urban area, you'll see the transport is actually a very significant source of air pollution. And one of the reasons why transport becomes a significant source is also because people uh, in that city are probably not able to use public transport or walk to a minimum distance. So somebody who has a, a, to buy a daily uh, some stuff, uh, which is within three or 400 meters or, uh, maybe slightly more actually ends up taking a motorized vehicle to that part and, and actually to buy that stuff, which can be bread, butter, or medicine. 
uh, uh, something as basic as that. And the reason they normally do is because they can't walk to till that shop because there is no proper footpath or it is unusable or it is unsafe. Uh, I think footpaths are something so basic that they not only impact on air pollution because it is uh, making people, giving, providing people that advantage of being able to walk to the nearest distance and not rely on a motorized transport, but also it boosts the confidence of an individual when they are not dependent on anything or anybody to be able to cover that first or last mile. Imagine a, a kid or a lady or somebody who's coming late at night in a, in a dark alley if it is unusable, then somebody else will be coming to the bus stop or in a car and picking them up. It defeats the entire purpose, right? Uh, if, uh, if a person could do the public, uh, use the public transport for the last part, but for the last part, they still need to rely on uh, motorized transport. So I, I think from that perspective, this is, this is a very, very important thing. And all I say is that, uh, the government, all it needs is to just provide better footpaths, safer footpaths, usable footpaths. Um, I mean, it's not only the people who uh, ride on expensive vehicles have the dignity, even pedestrians should have the dignity uh, and, and we should be responsible for providing them that. No, I, I completely agree. In fact, one of the studies I was reading uh, was also the, uh, related to gender and last mile connectivity. That's how you know, people who are, um, who doesn't get Absolutely. last mile connectivity, they lose on jobs because of the same reason. Exactly. Um, exactly. Um, uh, thank you uh, so much for uh, throwing light on this, uh, Partho. My last of the question for you is, 100 plus cities in India are designated as non-attainment. If air quality management does not become a priority for the government soon, what demographic groups would be affected the hardest initially? Hmm. Yeah, so unfortunately, uh, the people who are worst affected uh, by air pollution are basically the lower income group people. Um, uh, uh, I, I will also say that up to an extent, the low income group people are uh, uh, are also they they are they are staying at places where they are probably most affected. Also, I mean, their proximity to the pollution is higher. So they are staying under some flyovers near the roads, next to the roads, uh, in busy intersections. Uh, they are staying in a slum in unhygienic conditions. Sometimes they, they stay near a factory, just behind a factory. So there are a lot of areas where their exposure is higher. And uh, they are the pe people who will be most affected. Uh, and uh, Unfortunately, uh, they are up to a large extent. Sometimes I feel that they are also those people who are somehow not able to demand for it that much just because they are uh, not well educated. They do not know where to have the ask. A uh, lot of times uh, they are so busy with their livelihoods, uh, sustenance that uh, an issue like air pollution probably doesn't really uh, uh, bother to them. And last but not the least, also air pollution is not always visible, right? Sometimes if something is burning, you can see that. But otherwise, if it is a matter of AQI, looking at the air, you do not know whether the air is bad. Um, so I think until unless there is a visible smoke, uh, which is not there in, from the vehicles today, most of the, most of the vehicles, so therefore, probably people also don't know that they are exposed to very high population uh, pollution. So this population is definitely um, uh, uh, one of the most, uh, uh, how do you say that? They are, they are in the forefront facing the, uh, the brunt of it. All right. Um, thank you so much for answering all our questions so patiently. Um, and uh, also for um, giving your thoughts across the various spectrums in this space.